So this past Sunday, we, we talked about maybe the second most popular story of King David, and that's of David and Bathsheba. So often we can look at this story as just a man who committed adultery, and as a result, he had someone murdered, but that's not where it all began. You see, I don't believe that David just woke up one morning saying, you know what, I want to have Uriah murdered. See, if we were to interview a thousand inmates on death row, I don't believe that most of them would come out and say, yeah, I just want to kill somebody and it would be the greatest mistake of my life and have me sentenced to death. No, they would probably say, look, I started off doing something small, maybe something wrong that wasn't that bad, which led to something a little worse, which led to something a little worse, and eventually I commit this great mistake that I'm going to regret for the remainder of my life. And the same thing was with David. See, it all starts, this huge sin that he eventually commits, it all starts in the season where all the kings were supposed to be going out to battle. But instead of sending himself out there, he sends his army and he stays back. He's not where God wants him to be. He becomes isolated. And then David goes onto his rooftop, on his castle, and, and he looks over and he sees Bathsheba bathing on her roof. Now, David had a decision to make at that moment. He could flee from that sin. He could flee from that temptation because God had given him all the tools that he needed to accomplish that. Or, and what he decided to do was not submit to the authority of God because he viewed himself as the king. And so he invites her over. He sleeps with her. And she comes back and says that she's pregnant. So now he has consequences of his sin and he's trying to start to cover it up. So he invites her husband Uriah home to sleep with her. But Uriah has so much respect for David and his fellow soldiers that he chooses not to. And David, again, trying to cover up these consequences of his sin, he sends a messenger to, to, his, to the leader of his armies to push Uriah to the very front lines so that when the enemy came upon him, he would withdraw the army to where Uriah would be killed. And this is what happens. So what started off as just a little temptation eventually snowballed into someone being murdered. And the reason why I like this story, even though it's a very grim story, is it shows us just how destructive sin can be in our life. How this snowball effect of sin can start off something as so small, as so minuscule in our life, but eventually become something so great and consuming and captivating of our life in a negative sense. It it teaches us the dangers and that the wages of sin are indeed death. But what else I love about this story is really how it ends. You see, David commits this great sin, but his dear friend, the prophet Nathan, finds out about it. And he goes to David and he confronts him on his sin. But he didn't just go out and just start bashing him. No, he eased his way into that situation. He he allows David to see that what he did was wrong. And it brought David to a point of humility. It brought David to a point of, of repentance. And it really brought him back off of his high horse that he had been seated on. You see, in our lives, there might be situations where we are not where we are supposed to be. And in those moments, we're in danger because temptation's right around the corner. But likewise, we can't treat sin in these categories like, you know, well, this is just a little white lie. This isn't a big deal. It's not as big of a deal as murder. We need to treat sin universally. And so I want to ask you these questions. One, do you view sin like that in your life? Is all sin universally wrong for you? Or do you have a tendency to categorize it? The second thing is this. Do you have Nathans in your life, people in your life that can keep you accountable for the sin that you may commit to where they can encourage you and redirect you on your pursuit of Christ?